Hello, my friends. Here we go. Here it is. Saturday morning live stream here at the Garden Like a Viking headquarters. Northern Indiana, zone 5. Well, now they say zone 6, but eh, we'll see. This winter certainly is a zone five, uh, 6 winter or beyond. I mean, it is so unbelievably mild. Even though, yes, technically, I know, winter has not begun yet. Uh, but still, it is just extremely mild. I mean, we're having, is there's barely been any ice on the ice path. So that can tell you. Uh, yes. Paul Bannum says, hi to all at the club from a cold, wet, and dark UK. All right. Those are actually some of my favorite conditions. Yeah, I know. Like right now, uh, maybe 50 degrees. It's, it's like 55 degrees. I mean, it's incredibly warm for a middle of December. So let's see here, my friends. Let me know where you're at. If you got anything still growing, which is crazy. Uh, I got a lot of little things I want to talk about talk about with you guys. Uh, make sure that the sound is good. You know, I'm always tripping about the sound just to make sure it's good because video quality can be poor. You know, people can tolerate that, but sound quality has to be good in my experience. I can't listen to a video if there's not good sound quality. I'm just, they have to take care of that. So, uh... Let's see, Christopher Mennel, hello my friend, Val says, good morning everyone, warmed up to 36 here in northern Arizona, the high desert of Prescott, yes, yes, uh, Ken Harrison says, hey y'all, Texas has beautiful weather today, I bet, Santosh, hello my friend, Nate says, hey Nate, uh, Christina, hello from northwest Indiana, I'm not complaining about the weather, that's true, yeah, I know, most people are like, well, it's Warmer is fine. Uh, but I mean, we're not growing anything here anyways. It just, over the winter, the sun is really weak and it does, it will get cold enough to kill everything pretty much. The only thing still growing in the garden, the, a little bit of Komatsuna, which has been surprising. I mean, it is very, it, it's gotten down to, you know, 17 degrees, uh, a, a number, a couple of nights in a row. And the Komatsuna and the green onions, of course, are still going. Now the green onions, they don't really die. They just kind of, they just kind of, ooh, remind me to tell you guys why the mother-in-law's tongue is named that, okay? A little bit later. Um, but they don't really die, okay? The, uh, the green onions, they just kind of go into a state of suspended animation. Oh, and then when, it, when they thaw out, they'll just grow a little bit more, and then they'll thaw out and grow more and then freeze and just, it's incredible. But the, uh, the Shijimisa has succumbed. The um, uh, Komatsuna is still going really strong, though. The Shijimisa is impressive, though. I, I, I wanted to um, plant garlic in the bed, so I pulled it up and just kind of chucked it to the side. And uh, now it's like growing again, the Shijimisa. I, I just threw it on the ground, and now it's growing again. It's incredible. So they love the good soil bursting with life. Gary Taproot, hello my friend, says hello from Maryland. I still have lettuce and carrots outside, microgreens and soon sprouts inside. Yes, the good food and the breathing plus the freezing has me feeling good. Yes, see Gary Taproot is uh, tapped into this channel. Also the Thrive Like a Viking channel where we uh, do the um, um, mindfulness of breathing meditation. I guide you guys through that. And then we do, um, we have all kinds of practices happening interwoven cold training, sauna therapy, breath work, all that stuff. It all, it's all multifaceted to thriving. Growing your own food is where it starts. It's the foundation. Yes, growing food. Uh, what goes into your body is of utmost importance to the experience that you have in this realm. So, um, yes, very good. Uh, let's see. Jerry Bates. Hello, my friend says, what dried beans are you recommending for next year? My dry bean recommendations have changed dramatically. So here's the good mother Stollards. Okay. Which I love. Absolutely love. Super flavorful. Um, and they're great. They last all winter. They'll last several years in their dried state. Uh, but here's the thing. I, uh, have a bean sheller now, a pea and bean sheller, the Taylor Manufacturing Pea and Bean Sheller. If you guys watch my short that I made several months ago when I was in Tennessee, you will see it in action. 
and it is incredible. I mean, pumping out the, it just makes it seem, this took my uncle, my uncle, this came from his plot and he, he sits by the fire and shells them by hand. Now this took, I think he said a couple of three hours, something like that uh, of just, you know, not like intense work, but still shelling by the fire for like three hours to get this. Okay. Uh, as opposed to the um, bean sheller that you just run them through. This would be like two minutes. I, I, I mean, if that, it's incredible. So uh, here's the thing though. The good mother staller beans will not run through the bean sheller. Not properly. They kind of can a little bit, but they don't properly run through it. So I'm not growing them anymore because uh, I, I am uh, only going to grow ones that are going to grow through the through the uh, or that are going to go through the bean sheller because of how convenient it is. And yes, I, I understand people are like, oh, I love shelling them by hand, and I get it. You know, I did that way for years. But if you're talking about having substantial quantity, I mean, like a five gallon bucket full of beans, that's what I want to have at the end of each uh, uh, season. You know, going into the winter, I need to have like a five gallon bucket of beans. And to do that, it just not, I mean, unless you have nothing else going on in life or you really love shelling by hand, then uh, yeah, you can spend hours and hours doing that. But if you uh, want to do them for like an actual crop, you know, grow them so that you can eat them to sustain yourself, nourish yourself and your family, then the pea and bean sheller, man, it has changed the game because uh, now you can just grow as many as you possibly want. But the good mother stollards are too short. They don't go through the bean sheller. They just fall through the bottom. So uh, rattlesnake pull beans is my number one by far recommendation because you can eat them as a green bean all throughout the season, especially when they're nice and small, super good. And they taste almost like pine nuts. You know, what the heck? Can you get this open for me? Uh, seriously, the, uh, the um, rattlesnake pole bean is the one that you can eat as the green bean and then you can let them go until they are done uh, and dry. And then they become a shell bean and they feed through the, uh, pea and bean sheller super well. I mean, just you can just blah, 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 as many as you can shove in there. They're just ching, 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 falling out. It's so nice, guys. It's so nice. So let me make sure that this is turned up. Um, now, that brings me to another thing. These are not classically beans. These are, these are the purple hall pink eye peas, okay? Um, and... I really enjoy them. I just started growing them this year because of the bean sheller. That's what most people in the South are using this Taylor Manufacturing Pea and Bean Sheller for, Purple Hall Pink Eye Peas. So I said, okay, well, I got to grow some. And uh, I grew them. They grow very prolific. They're super easy to harvest. And yes, they will climb up a cattle panel trellis. So I've got a, tr a cattle panel trellis that is, you know, four feet high. And uh, hello, Alexander. It's four feet high and, you know, they're like 16, 32 feet, stuff like that. Um, and so you plant them along about every four inches and they wind up. They, they're not like peas. They don't have tendrils. That they're not, they don't have climbers like that. But they're more like, uh, there's not really anything. They're, they're like a cross because they'll just wrap around, kind of like a morning glory. Except not nearly as vicious as morning glories. Um, but... They were super delicious and they're so easy to harvest because the plant grows up the trellis, but then it has uh, the peas like hang out from it. I mean, they're really easy to get to. And so, uh, and they're super delicious and you can can them fresh or you can dry them like this. They're super easy to run through the bean sheller. And uh, yes, so these I'm highly recommending and they grow, they thrive in the heat and humidity. So if you're in the south anywhere, these are, these are made for hot, humid. They grow in the deep south. And uh, so up here, no problem. H hot, humid. Uh, our, our winters have, or our uh, summers have been very hot and humid uh, recently. They've been like southern summers. Okay, finally. Um, they've been like southern summers here. To f somewhat. No, not like true. Uh, I spent a month in New Orleans uh, some years ago. And... 
that was unlike anything. That was worse than Thailand, worse than Vietnam, worse than anywhere that I'd ever been as far as uh, just oppressive, hot, and humid. It was unbelievable. So uh, now another one. Someone asked about Anasazi beans, okay? Those are also called 1,500-year-old uh, cave beans, and I like those as well. I've grown those. Those plants get huge, okay? Just remember that. They will get 20 feet I mean, I had a 10-foot trellis. If you watch my video, pole bean tri privacy fence, I did it in the back where I set up two, you know, I put T-posts into the ground and then slid 10-foot uh, sections of PVC over that. And I had a line, a paracord going from the two up top like that. And then I had uh, just, just baling twine coming down every foot or so. And uh, then I planted them at the base. They grew all the way up that 10-foot trellis, fell back down, Grew all the way up it again, fell back down, and I mean, it was just crazy. So uh, it was a huge mass of, uh, it was like bowing in the, uh, the, the, the supports. So I had to tie strings up at the top of the supports and, and put it back out. But um, those are really good. They're very similar in flavor to the um, rattlesnake beans. I can't remember, though, if I don't think that I was eating the Anasazi beans as a shell bean or as a green bean. This is vitally important to me in my parameters. When you say, okay, I need to grow this or that. Well, why? Well, the, uh, the rattlesnake bean has the dual purpose. Everything in the garden has to have a purpose, especially when we're still have compact space. Once we get the land and the ranch and we have a lot of unlimited space, uh, then yes, we'll be growing distinctly different kinds, of course. Um, let's see here. Christopher Minnell, that's a great question. He says, hi, Nate. Doesn't it take the same amount of time for microbes to unlock nutrients when you plant kitchen scraps in the garden than to the JLF, the kitchen scraps? No, not exactly. Because the uh, it's all about the liquid. Uh, most of the microorganisms, and this is most people aren't aware of this when they're talking about anaerobic and aerobic, uh, most of the microorganisms are aquatic creatures, actually. And even in what appears to be dry soil, there is a microscopic layer of water that is uh, that, that is, surrounds everything, the roots and the soil and all of that. And this is where the uh, microorganisms move upon that. When we make the JLF, it gets hot. It gets nice and hot and it's full of water. And so the microorganisms can just move all over the place real fast. And everything just happens so much faster because of the water and the heat. And uh, when we put it underground, it's not getting the same amount of heat. If we just bury the kitchen scraps, it doesn't have the same amount of water or the heat. Now, burying the kitchen scrap is, is wonderful. Perfectly fine. Um, although you will need a protocol in place because obviously rodents want to start digging into your stuff. Uh, if you don't bury them deep enough. But uh, the JLF will decompose it so much faster. I mean, so much faster. Because when I when when the good JLF in the black barrels, uh, when I put stuff into there, like in the middle of summer, it is totally digested in like six weeks. I mean, I mean, liquefied. It's unbelievable. So, um, yeah. And remember, guys, with anaerobic ferments, predominantly anaerobic ferments, um, it's perfectly fine. So the microorganisms consume all of the food that is available to them. Most of them are conditionally aerobic or facultative anaerobe, whatever way you want to put it, meaning that they can survive and thrive just fine with or without oxygen. This is like 70 to 80% of them. And so based upon current science and all of that, which current science only understands a tiny fraction of the, the microbes that are present. They, they've only, they've only, there's like, however many millions of different estimated species and only how many thousands have 15, 20,000, if I remember right, have been actually cataloged, actually identified. So we really know next to nothing about the, all the different species and all of this. Uh, but we do know that they can survive and thrive in like either conditions. So remember the microorganisms will consume all of the food in the JLF. And then when it is done, once they've consumed all the food, uh, and, and the, the um, system can no longer sustain their waste products, then they will all die. Uh, but 
they leave behind their bodies and their feces and their activity. And that is very plant available, very good for the plants. The soil uh, can use that, the plants can use that. And uh, even if it's not 100% plant ready available at that time, it's very easily made plant available by the remaining microorganisms in the soil. So that's why we're not cultivating microbes in the JLF. We're cultivating, we're, we're, we're digesting nutrients. Yeah, it's very different than like an aerated compost tea or a JDOM or a JDOM microbial solution. Those, we actually don't multiply the nutrients. Those aren't really about the nutrients. Those are about um, multiplying the biology. Yes, yes. The fourth wise man says, Nate, yep, it's all aquatic life. He's talking about the microorganisms. They are aquatic. Uh, some needs more moisture than others, and as much as the anaerobic can get ugly, it's still necessary as a food source for aerobic. Absolutely, guys. It is so wonderful and beautiful, and the interconnectedness of all things when you begin to research and look deeply into the natural cycles and the processes of things, nature that surrounds you. When you look into it, you think, wow, just, just wow. The more you understand about it, the more it leaves you speechless. And if it doesn't leave you in a state of like awe, like jaw dropping awe, then you haven't gone deep enough. You haven't seen it deeply enough because once you do, it's guaranteed to be awe inspiring. Yes, yes, yes. Big West says Dr. Elaine started the, the soil food web understandings in 1995. We are just starting to understand, exactly. We need to properly share as we learn this stuff, I feel. Yes, I agree, Big Wes, definitely. And we have, to, uh, we have to also make the distinction between, okay, how much do we scientifically need to know as opposed to empirically, experientially, when it comes to growing food? How much scientific laboratory research and stuff needs to be done when uh, growing food doesn't actually require any of that understanding, or maybe a base uh, uh, level of understanding of that. But if you, the more that you do it, the more that you observe the plants, the more that you get to feel, the more that you stop thinking about it so much and just feel what the earth is trying to tell you, feel what the plants are trying to tell you, feel the weather conditions, smell the air, the humidity, the, the, all of this stuff comes in. It all comes in to, to, the, to the equation. And the more that you just feel all of this, then uh, the less any kind of scientific, uh, um, the less important the science becomes because you know what is happening uh, based upon seeing, doing and seeing and experience. Experience is key. That being said, it's a wonderful to have a scientific understanding of all of this as well. Uh, Scott Miller says, snap lock lids, $1.25, clear silicone gaskets. Ooh, nice. Yes. Speaking of lids, guys. Um, okay, real quick. Look to Nature says, I want to branch into IMO boxes next year to up my fungal game. Yeah, yeah, and that's possible. Here's the thing about IMO, guys, and some people will disagree with me, but this has been my experience over the years, uh, is that the IMO, and she's talking about, or he is talking about in um, the uh, Korean natural farming tradition, where you put the, the uh, rice, the cooked rice, into the forest and, and get the microbes there and then bring it out. And then as a big, drawn out, long, lengthy process with lots of different ingredients, where you have to go through, and I've done it a couple of times, so I know, where you have to go through the different stages of making the IMO into IMO2, IMO3, and then IMO4, and then you can liquefy the IMO and put it on the shelf. Okay, uh, but it requires, you know, 50 pound bags of bran and, and just d different things that, that uh, are not plentiful here and that don't make sense here. Yeah, Kim Williams, so IMO is the Korean natural farming indigenous microorganisms um, and it, it, it works the only time now now in my experience the only time that that is beneficial this is my opinion uh, is if you cannot gather leaf mold in any substantial quantity 
if you can, uh, if you are like, have to go into a national forest or like a redwood forest or someplace where you don't want to be removing anything from, uh, then that's the ideal way because you're not removing anything. You just put the box in there and the microbes jump into the box and then you can take it out and start the big lengthy process of turning it into different, the different IMO numbers. But for those of us that live in areas like in the Midwest where there's just forest, you know, just where it's just like forest, you know, um, and they're not national forests. They're just like on a private property or they're on your property or they're just like uh, it's very different here than it is out west. You know, um, and I used to live there. I know I've been all over the states as well. And uh, so these kind of forests, you can go in and you can get the high quality leaf mold in whatever quantity you want, really. Um, and so a couple five gallon buckets of the leaf mold. And if you watch the video I made all about the leaf mold, then that's going to be as high quality IMO as it can get, in my opinion. It totally replaces the whole need for making the big long process of the liquid IMOs. So if that's the only advantage is if you have to go into a national forest or something and uh, collect the, you know, something where you can't take even a handful of stuff out. Other than that, leaf mold is already, I mean, true leaf mold soil is already the most perfect indigenous microorganism that you can get. Eric, yes, yes, I do. Yes, I do. That's one of the secret ingredients you'll see in the video this year. Um, so that is my, uh, that is my thing about, um, making liquid, you know, IMO in the KNF tradition. Now, if you are, some people love like being the mad scientists and doing all these things and that's totally fine. Nothing against that, but that's the reason I don't use or promote the whole big drawn out IMO process. Okay. Um, so there you go. The Chase fam, what's up, my friend? Stephanie Stevens, listen to the garden check. Yes, absolutely. Brian, yes, you're getting it. He says, yes, the vastness of the one is awe inspiring. AK Froggy says, we had a forest fire in 96 and the trees are now coming back. Can I still use the leaf mold effectively? Yes. Yes, you can use that leaf mold, definitely. Um, so guys, hopefully you are starting to sprout, okay? You watched the video I made last year about sprouts, and uh, now is the indoor gardening time. So we, uh, I, I've been using these lids quite some time now, and uh, they are in the Amazon storefront. So if you go to there, and it's like the indoor growing supplies, or maybe the fermentation chapter, or whatever it is. These lids, so they truly don't rust. I, I was very hesitant at first uh, and because they claim rust proof, that they do not rust. So they're made of like 316 stainless steel. They're much heavier than the normal lids. This is like twice or three times the weight of the other lids. Uh, and then there's this screen. And so these things are really nice, guys. Put them on here. And this is how I soak uh, sprouts. This is also how I soak uh, things, microgreens, before I spread them out. So it makes it really nice and easy. Mm -hmm. um, now here's another kind. Here's another kind that are also very good, especially if you want to stand them upside down, then they leave for some airflow like that. Uh, these are also great, but you know, tend to limit plastic where you can because if you can use stainless steel if you can use metal i just feel like it's better so um that these are two very good options i think they're both in the um amazon storefront uh you could get these for someone for christmas they would love it uh you could get them a 12 pack or something of the uh the court wide mouth mason jars and like two packs of these and uh then a bunch of seeds. I mean, think about that. You could get them a bunch of seeds, which I'll show you in a minute, and uh, keep it a nice little packet. I'm talking about Christmas, guys. So what are you getting for the people for Christmas? What kind of things are you got in mind for Christmas? Share your ideas in case other people need some ideas. 
Serene Dakota, $5. Thank you very much, my friend. Says, I'm late and can't stay long today, but we'll rewatch. Much love, Nate and Tribe. I have two gallons of craft I made to give as gift. My peep are loving it. Ooh, yes, my friend. Two gallons of craft. Craft, what is that? Scott Miller says, yes, rattlesnake beans are good for green as well as dry. That's what Nate says. I'm going to try them in a Three Sisters planting this spring. Yes, the rattlesnake will work great for Three Sisters. You just got to make sure that you choose a big, strong corn variety such as um, Glass Gem because you can't be having no wimpy little uh, uh, flimsy little like, um, uh, what was it, painted mountain corn, Okay which is also a dry corn. It has to be dry corn, the three sisters, remember that. Dry beans, dried corn, and winter squash. Don't be doing green beans with, with um, sweet corn and stuff. And, you know, People do that and they're all, three sisters doesn't work. Well, it's because they did that. They said sweet corn with green beans, it just they don't get it. It's for drying, it's for storage. So the three sisters, uh, you wanna use glass gem. If you're using like a painted mountain corn, it only gets four feet tall, five feet tall. And the, uh, the green beans, will totally smother out that and it will make them collapse. You want to choose a big strong one like the um, glass gem and you want to give it about 10 days to two weeks before you plant the beans. So you want the corn to actually be sprouted already like this a couple inches big before you plant uh, the green, the um, rattlesnake beans. Mm hmm. Stephanie Stevens says the jar and lids. Good Christmas gift. Yes. Yes, definitely. Um, ooh, outside in Georgia says thanks for the info, Nate. Just bought one of those tents to start steeds from your videos. I'm excited. Yes, uh, that is awesome. And we are going to, I am going to make a microgreens video. It will probably be right at the beginning of the year. I'm kind of just taking this the rest of the year off from making uh, videos on this channel um, for various reasons, you know, but I'm going to start back up uh, in January, definitely. And we will do um, microgreens videos. Now, you can use that tent for microgreens. I suggest getting a few good runs of microgreens under your belt um, before seed starting comes because that's how you know, that's how you know that your system is... Um, on point and all your conditions are right. So watch the video that I made called Seed Starting Masterclass. There's a link to that video in the description. And uh, um, okay, Scott Miller says, I want a food dehydrator for Christmas. Oh yeah, get the Kasori 10 tray. Definitely, I think there's a link in the description or it's in my Amazon storefront. That is my favorite one. The Kasori is great bang for the buck. Ha, look to nature says, Amazon is selling a mix with sweet corn sold as the three sisters. I know, I, yeah, see, it's, it's just ridiculous. But that is the uh, nature of the internet now and stuff. So everyone can be an expert and just say, okay guys, and even though they've never done it. So, okay guys, welcome to my channel. We're going to do a three sisters garden. So I've got Fisher's early sweet corn and then I've got, you know, green beans and we've got uh, cr uh, crook neck summer squash, you know, so there's three sisters. And then somebody watches that video and goes, oh, that's three sisters. And then tells five other people and five other people tell those. And that's how it all happens when uh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, of course, because he hasn't done it. Stone Creek says, Nate, do you start leeks at the same time as you start your onions? I can't say for sure, guys, because I have not grown leeks before. No, because I don't, um, well, I have green onions the size of leeks, you know, king green onions. Also, um, also uh, for super early spring, the Egyptian walking onions, which are fantastic. And guys, I think we're going to end up selling a, uh, a batch you know, a small, small batch, but we're going to end up selling some later this coming year, you know, when they're ready in like September, we're probably going to uh, sell little packages uh, from, we're talking about from my uncle's farm where we've been growing them. 
So you can, uh, it'll be like, um, I don't know, like a $40 minimum or something. And then you'll get, when the harvest comes, uh, you can pre-order it. And then when the harvest comes, it'll give you your packet of uh, Viking grown Egyptian walking onions with probably some Tahitian melon squash seeds and maybe some rattlesnake pole bean seeds all from the farm. So yeah, look out for that if you guys are interested. Uh, let's see. Look to nature says elephant garlic. Well, okay. Yeah. So that, that all was a way to say that I haven't needed to grow leeks. Um, elephant, uh, look to nature says elephant garlic is a type of leek. So maybe fall or early spring. I already planted the elephant garlic. I plant it just with the regular garlic. So, um, yeah. B Heart says, healing, love, and light. I'm glad that I stumbled upon this channel. I just moved to Southern Oregon to implement electroculture as well as other uh, like no-till harvesting with the marijuana fields. Okay. Good luck, my friend. And be sure to keep us posted on your results of the electroculture experiments. Uh, we have a Discord channel, guys. Remember that? Okay. Um, check out the discord, which is like exploding now, like turning uh, all kinds of good pictures and testimonies and sharing knowledge and all that. It's wonderful. Aaron Johnson says, I really need a tomato mill and pressure canning supplies. Yeah. See, uh, if you watch my video about, if you're just trying to make sauce, watch my video that I made this year about making the tomato sauce. You don't need a mill. You don't need anything, uh, but the blender. And it's way nice. And so long as you let it go long enough, it's just nice and pureed. There is no, there is no seed or no stem, no stalks, all that stuff. Stems. Uh, Michael Eversberg says, Nate, is the Excalibur food dehydrator a good dehydrator? Now, I have never had that one. But I know from other people in the know, they say that yes, they like it a lot. Um, so I would assume that it's good, although I have no personal experience with it. Uh, I do have personal experience with several other types of dehydrators and of those, the Kasori is the best. I mean, especially for the price. Uh, I got the 10 tray one. Uh, we got, my mom got the five or six tray one. The 10 tray one is like quadruple the capacity. It's unbelievable how much you can fit in that thing. So, um, it's super nice, very effective. Yeah, Matt S808 says, Hawaii lowest temps at the moment is 65. Nice. So uh, let's see here. Uh, Mafia clan says, uh, got a tiller for Christmas, went and broke ground for a garden, then watched your video saying that's the worst thing to do before winter. Now that the damage is done, what should I do? Okay. Where are you at? Where are you at? So if you got a tiller, then you should, and you've already tilled it up, then you should immediately plant something, uh, like winter rye. Okay. Um, but where, where exactly are you at? So, um, so yeah, so if you've already tilled it up, then I suggest you got to get a living root in the ground. Okay. That's the whole thing. Uh, that's the whole purpose of the, of the whole, um, thing. And so if you're going to end up tilling and so you've got a, um, okay. Southwest Missouri. Okay. Then you got plenty of time then. So, or, well, not time, but it, it'll work. So go ahead and now get you some winter rye. And uh, you're going to let it, it's going to sprout. Even now it'll sprout and it will get them roots in the ground. And then as early as possible, it's going to start growing and uh, it's going to grow and grow and them roots are going to go deep. And if you've got a tiller, then you don't have to wait until the right time to terminate it. Like the biggest downfall with winter rye and mini cover crops in the no till method is that you have to terminate it only at the right time. If you don't, it'll grow back. But if you got a tiller, then you can green manure it. Watch the video that I made earlier in the fall, just a few months ago. 
um, called green manure or something like that. Uh, it says ultimate gardening method and it's very effective. And so, um, that's what I recommend. Go ahead and plant something. Winter rye is going to be the best and then till it in two weeks before you need to plant or a week even before you need to plant. Sam Potzik says, uh, $5. Thank you very much. My friend says, thanks, Nate new to the channel and really resonate with your thinking. So inspired by your house plants, I had to start working on a canopy in my house. <laughs> yes, definitely. The house plants are just insane. They've gone totally insane. Now I can say for sure though, um, the first several years that I was at this place, uh, the air conditioner was broke. And so I didn't use AC and I had the windows open all summer. So it was like 86, 88 degrees, sometimes 90 degrees in here and humid, which was terrible for me but the plants the pothos loved it because it mimicked its natural environment and they would literally grow 15 feet in that one summer so i did that for like two or three summers and um they're like 30 feet long you know but but now that the air conditioner is fixed and i keep the house at like you know 56 58 maybe 60 uh to the maximum in the uh, winter time the plants don't grow nearly as much like a foot you know, as opposed to 15 feet. Um, but now is the time to clone your uh, pothos and stuff. And you see, once they start putting down these roots like that, now it's pretty much ready to go into the uh, soil. So we like to do this and give them away as Christmas gifts, even though nobody asks for them. It doesn't matter. We're just going to spread the love anyways, plant it and uh, give it to the people. Yeah. Uh, Santos says, I did what you said with the winter rye, but I added clover. Not a problem. That's not a problem. If, if you can till, if you're going to green manure it, that's not a problem at all. Mm -hmm. Uh, Matia says, does winter rye grow pretty well in Missouri? Any kind of extra love to keep them through the winter? No, winter rye will easily grow in Missouri because winter rye will grow in Minnesota over the winter. It'll grow in North Dakota over the winter. I mean, it's, uh, it's hardly down to like zone two, you know, negative 40 degrees. Um, and when it's that cold, most of the time there's snow on the ground anyways. And so it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Uh, no winter rye will make it no problem. So you can plant that till that in when it's time. Um, I, and now normally I would recommend a clover in there as well, but you're not, it's, you're, you're so late that it's not really going to last. It's not really, it's not going to sprout. I, I don't think it will sprout. Maybe in your area in Missouri, it will. So if you'd like plant winter rye with a crimson clover, okay. Or a red clover, you can do either, but for your area, I would do crimson clover. So a rye winter rye and a crimson clover 50, 50 spread it out pretty heavily and uh, let it do its thing. And then when it comes time in the spring, till it all in for the green manure. Okay. Now, ultimately, getting away from the tilling is what you'll want to do because it does produce superior soil, superior community of microorganisms. I know that's not what you want to hear when you just got a brand new tiller, but for the next several years, at least, you can utilize that tiller as a green manure machine. So you can grow the cover crop and till it in. And that's going to help to establish a good soil. In my experience, what do I always say? So many people want to go straight into no-till because they'll watch a few videos on YouTube about people, market gardeners, which is totally different than, than, the, than what we're doing, sustenance gardening, survival gardening. Uh, you know, So they'll watch a few videos where people bring in dump trucks and tri-axle loads full of compost and then have, have a cardboard factory somewhere nearby where they can get just miles of cardboard, lay down the cardboard, put down you know, a foot of compost over the top and plant your stuff into there. Now that kind of, now that works. Okay. Uh, for market gardening, that's great. But, uh, there's several drawbacks to that guys. One, you have to have access to triaxle loads of compost every year. Uh, two, you have to have the cardboard. Uh, and then three, and the primary thing is that what it does is that it never addresses the underlying 
uh, compaction layer of most soils, especially if you're in the Midwest or areas with heavy clay soils. Those kind of people that just bring in the uh, cardboard, lay it down, put the compost on top. After the first year, they will end up with like one inch of compost on top of rock solid clay that the roots just can't penetrate through because all that compost is just going to break down, sort of wash out. And then the, the soil underneath is going to be uh, still rock solid because there's not the air in there. And it's, uh, it's going to not be able to breathe into the soil. So it's advantageous. The first couple of years, you can green manure it to help break up that hard pan and to get organic matter into there so that then the roots can um, penetrate all of that stuff. So after three or four seasons like that, then you can move to, to no-till and that will be superior. It's way better for the soil in the long run. Yes, yes, yes. So VA Green says, I've been feeding my worms some of the banana bloom mix. They love it. Oh, I bet. They definitely. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Fourth Wiseman, that's a very healthy plant. Oh, yes, definitely. Yes, this one is loving life. It's uh, not very old, actually, just a few weeks and uh, still producing pretty heavily. So here's some other things, guys. Um, now, I hesitate to even tell you the variety of onion this is because I haven't got my seeds yet. And so uh, I don't want them to sell out. <laughs> but no, the yellow of Parma, guys, the yellow of Parma, these things, look, I mean, I know it's only middle December, but they're still rock solid. They got a nice thick skin on them. We've got like 100 more of these in the basement. And uh, these are nice and pungent. Nice and delicious, full of those sulfuric compounds. Can't recommend it highly enough, the yellow of Parma. That's the only one I'll be growing this and the Weathersfield Red next year. Those are the two. I've still got, you know, 30 of the Weathersfield Red uh, onions in the basement as well. Same thing. They're just a little bit smaller, naturally, medium size. You know, um, but this is one of the medium yellow of Parma. Some of them are much bigger, which I don't really like much bigger onions because they're hard to use like that. Um, yeah, so these work really well. Yellow of Parma. Now, here's a disheartening thing, guys. The, um, so the garlic, though, something has happened to it. It's got like a withering away disease that, uh, so I'm still trying to investigate exactly. I think it's the Fusarium wilt, bald, Fusarium bald rot. Um, and so, cause look, this is what happens. The clove looks real nice and delicious and just like all the rest, but then you go to touch it and look, it just crushes. It's like hollow. It just becomes hollow like this one. See how it looks like it's nice and plump and delicious. Look at that. Just crush, crush. It's just hollow. So um, this happened to about 30% of the onion bulbs this year or the, uh, the garlic bulbs. And so I attribute a lot of it to the fact that, uh, I have been like a, um, a, uh, garlic, you know, anybody, I was like anyone that wants to send me garlic or anyone that wants to, I would always take people's garlic and stuff and plant it because I love all the different varieties of garlic, never being seed garlic because seed garlic is so ridiculously expensive. Uh, and I think surely it came in on some of those people's stuff. Uh, and I just wasn't aware of it, you know, so, or something like that. So what I did this year is uh, I, I moved the patch, um, and just because to see if that helps for any reason. So I moved the patch and, um, did a few other things different. So we will see, and we're using certified seed garlic. All the garlic we planted this year is certified seed. We also have some of the Bates family garlic as well, which, uh, is beautiful and delicious as well. But that's what we're calling that variety Bates. Um, yeah, Jamie Copeland says yellow of Parma is my new go-to. Couldn't be happier. Yeah, I'm the same way. I mean, it, it literally, you couldn't ask for anything more from an onion. I mean, pungent stores a long time, easy to grow. Uh, fantastic. 
So, yeah. Um, uh, the link said something. Okay, cardboard over a stack of leaves. That's okay, yes? It depends on what you want to do. Are you trying to make them become leaf mold? Uh, because if you, uh, you can't actually, you don't actually plant into the leaves themselves. So if your plan is to have leaves on the ground, put cardboard on top and something to weight that down and to let it all stay in place and decompose, that'll be great. In the spring or when you go to plant, you could put holes in the cardboard, but then you have to plant into the actual soil underneath, mostly into the soil underneath. You don't just plant it into fluffy leaves because the plants don't thrive like that. Tomatoes are about the only thing that can do that. The tomatoes will actually put their roots down just in a pile of leaves, you know, and they love it. But most other plants, that's not going to suffice for them. So, um, or you could remove the cardboard and then uh, plant into the soil underneath and use the leaves that are now matted down as a uh, type of mulch. So, yeah, it can work. Yeah. Yes, Fourth Wiseman says, soil aeration too low and or watering can cause this rot and garlic over watering. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they didn't receive any of that. The soil is prime. The soil is really wonderful. Uh, now, w one thing I will say, though, that I think has definitely happened is that, um, so I've been making the videos and stuff, and I've been a little overzealous, you know, the past handful of, handful of years with gathering the manures. And so I think that I put... Uh, just too much manures on top of the garlic last year. I think that's the main thing. They were overfed because they were just boom, just a huge, luscious. Even though I didn't fertilize with anything um, except just aerated compost teas, which is a type of fertilizer, but not not like not like one of the Jadam fertilizers and stuff um, as far as nutrients goes. But I think that's what it's attributed to. I put I put down horse and chicken manure. Uh, on the garlic each year for like the past four years, you know, so I think it's finally just built up to the point where it's too much. It's too rich and that can definitely happen. Mm -hmm. So, uh, let's see the, uh, Okay, Matia says, where I'm at in Missouri, it's very rocky and full of clay. Will the clover and rye need any fertilizer or are they pretty natural growing? They will grow no matter what. Yeah, they will grow, definitely. So if, if it's rocky clay soil that's not had a lot of love given to it, then you definitely want to plant a clover as well because they will help to fix the nitrogen. The, um, the rye will, if, if this was in, now if this was in uh, September, or October, then I would say till it up and only plant the crimson clover um, and just not even mess with the uh, winter rye, but you're already too late. So you'll need that winter rye for the biomass because you'll till that in and that's the manure. So just do a clover and a rye. Garth says, I'm seeing 73 likes. Yeah, let's get the likes up, guys. Click the thumbs up, definitely, yes. Uh, I'm seeing 91, yes. The garlic seemed to be grown properly because it gave a good bulb and was able to be stored. The issue seems to be something after harvest, maybe too humid when curing or storing. Right, uh, Berkirsch account says that, yes. And uh, that is also what I sort of uh, had thought about, however, they, it, it clearly begun because when I harvested it, they, they already, I was already seeing it, you know, so, it, so it was already, and I, to be honest, I, I really noticed it towards the last quarter, third of their life cycle. I just noticed, I mean, something is off on it. I just noticed that they were, they were terminating too soon. They were too big and too luscious too fast. And, and they were too, so they sort of self-terminated several weeks too early. 
and stuff. So I, I, I could just tell that there was, and the way that the leaves were discoloring was not what is typical of that. So it, it, it started long before that. When I was harvesting, I was just hoping that it wouldn't uh, spread, but it's definitely, it definitely progressed in storage. Now, that being said, the, um, it only affected the hardnecks. I have several softneck varieties. It only affected the hardnecks. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Santo says, can I terminate the rye by covering with leaves or a tarp a couple months before planting? Ha! You can try, but not really. Um, well, in a couple months, I mean, you're going to miss the main part of their benefit. So, uh, you watch the videos I've made on cover cropping. If you've got winter rye, you just have to wait until the right time. And so for your heat loving stuff, that's not going to be a problem because the time comes about the middle of May is when the, um, maybe a week or two sooner. If you're in a warmer area, it will come about m beginning to middle of May. And so then once it sets the milk, once it gets to the milk stage, once the seed starts to appear, then you will be able to terminate it and it will not grow back. Uh, and that's what I recommend. But um, if you have to, if you're trying to plant a cool season crop in there, like in April or May uh, uh, or, you know, March or April or something, uh, you can try. But I mean, I've tried so many different ways to terminate winter rye early and it just doesn't. It just wants to come back. I mean, it's a grass, a very vicious, um, vigorous, uh, aggressive grass. Yes. Michael Eversberg, Nate, will rabbit onion, will rabbit manure be good for onions? Absolutely. It will. Yes, absolutely. Now you can, um, make a tea out of that, or you can just mix it right into the soil or even after the onions are growing, you can uh, put it around. Yeah. Oops. Tirza says, anyone else noted, noting an atypical lack of earthworms in their area, even for this time of year? Several other holistic gardeners within an hour of me noticing the same. Very interesting. Uh, I, of course, do not ever notice that because this soil is screaming with earth, earthworms. I mean, I can hear them. You know, when it goes out and it's raining, on a, on a raining, a gentle rain at nighttime, I'll go out with a headlamp, and every step you take, they're just like, doom, 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 doom everywhere so many of them but it wasn't like this um when i first got here and i've only been in this place like four years now something maybe five years now so uh in just that short time it's just really gotten to be incredible so it's uh it wasn't like that at first because this was just lawn that the people were mowing for, for the, ever you know Wayne Caroli, 20 bucks. Thank you very much, my friend. Says, happy winter solstice. Yes, coming up, isn't it? Coming up. The days are getting shorter still, but once the, uh, what is it this year, the 22nd, or is it the 20th? Uh, then summer will officially be on its way. And Scott Murray, $10. Thanks a lot, Dad. What's your question? What's your gardening question? Maybe you should get on the sprouts. Hmm? Get you some of these lids and get on the sprout train. So, Christopher Minnell says, Nate, it's summer here in South Africa. What will happen if I don't remove and replant sweet potato slips from sweet potatoes that I planted in the ground? Okay, what will happen if I don't remove and replant sweet potato slips from sweet potatoes I plant? Well, if you're in... Are you in like the tropics? Is it sort of tropical where, where it is? Because um, in most, in those kind of places, like in Florida or Australia and stuff, if you ever watch Self-Sufficient Me, yeah, a, a lot of people are into that uh, channel. Great. Mark is great. I mean, he, he is uh, fantastic. That is a fantastic channel. Uh, but very different climate conditions than most of us. And so that really, I mean, the knowledge on the channel is still top, top tier of course. And so is his personality and everything, but growing in tropical subtropics or something, Australia is just so different 
than than to us and they get the colds but i'm saying this because he uh shows you everything you need to know about sweet potatoes in in hot climates and they just grow everywhere they just grow everywhere uh, as I'm sure that they would. I mean, even here, they get 20 and 30 feet long and they will just keep setting down sweet potatoes and growing from those again. But we have the winters where they all die. So um, uh, if you have that kind of winter, I'm not sure what it's like in South Africa, but if you have the kind of winter where the two, where the ground freezes down to like a foot even, you know, then the uh, the tubers are going to freeze and they will die. But if it's not that harsh of a winter, if you just get like a couple light frosts or something enough to kill the foliage, that's perfectly fine because the tuber will remain and um, then it will grow again next year. But if you want to really purposely grow sweet potatoes, yes, you need to um, start slips from them every year. That's the way to ensure the best harvest. If you have enough room and the, the right climate, yeah, you can just let them grow all over the place. But it's always best um, to purposely Start something and plant it. And I'm talking like sweet potatoes or potatoes or uh, tomatoes. You know, yes, in some places, tomatoes can just volunteer, but they're never as, it's never as strong and you won't get the same type of harvest. I mean, they can be as strong, but it's just so much more of a wild card. So you really, you want to start the stuff and plant it in its place intentionally. Scorpio, $20. Thank you very much, my friend. Thank you guys for the tips. Uh, the So uh, a couple more things. <clears throat> guys, does anyone know anything about something like this? My uh, great grandpa, uh, my great grandpa uh, Berghoff gave this to me about 30 years ago, 25, 30 years ago. And he said that they found it uh, when he was um, either excavating uh, land for a, a highway or maybe it was a railroad, I forget, but they found it. And uh, he had it, it was in the 1940s that they found it. And so um, he gave it to me. Does anyone have any idea what something like this is? I mean, obviously I'm sure it's an, an ax of some kind, you know? But do you know like about how old something like this would be? How, how, um, how uh, common it is to find these kind of things? Like what? You know? So, yeah. Wes, it's a plum. Yeah, I don't know. Well, it could be. You know, maybe they, they were building their, maybe they were building teepees and stuff like that with uh, plum bobs. Kip Tap says, uh, oh, $10. Thank you, my friend. Says, finally got a decent walk. Thank you for the recommendation. Oh, yeah. Did you get the Yakuza or whatever one is in the Amazon storefront? That's, dude, it's amazing. I've been making stir fries in that thing. It's great. Uh, Bakersh account, $5. Thank you, my friend. Says, just saying thanks and paying for the value. Nice. Nice. Yes. Um, yeah, and that feels good, you know? So I'm giving you guys some of my time. So the tips are like a a uh, symbolic representation of your time because obviously you had to do something to get the money. So that is like a, uh, it's a good exchange, right? So thank you. Um, where was it found? Lisa of Light says, where was it found? It'd be, it'd be around here somewhere. He lived in, it'd be around in uh, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio area, something like that. But uh, it's super cool. I mean, you can tell someone spent a lot of time on it. And, uh, the, there's this part got chunked out of it, you know, but I thought it was pretty cool. So, uh, mm -hmm. oh yeah, definitely. The fourth wise man says, certainly looks like an ax head with a, oh yeah, to bind it to something. Yeah, to bind it to something. It's, it's just so heavy and it's just crazy how, I mean, man, the binding, I would love to see how someone would bind it in such a way that uh it wouldn't get loose but isn't it nice how like symmetrical how, how it's like someone spent a lot of time so um yes now there's a couple of other things that we're going to be talking about so 
Phoenix Rising says, it's time to start learning about preserving and canning. That's right, my friend. So check out the videos I've been making the past two years. Look, we just finished making a good thing of beef tallow just yesterday. And uh, here's what's important, guys, is that you get the fat and go to the butcher or your wherever it is, or if someone is processing your, your cows, uh, say you want the fat. You want especially the kidney fat, the real soft, fluffy white stuff that surrounds the kidneys. This is the best for the tallows, but any fat will do. And uh, you render it down. Now, here is the secret, though. When you're rendering tallow, you have to do it um, on as low of heat as possible. And it just takes several hours. But don't get overzealous. Don't get impatient and crank it up to even medium. All right? You want this stuff to, at the lowest possible heat, render down. Because otherwise, if you do it at too high of heat, it is going to uh, all taste like fried chicken. Like old gas station fried chicken. Yeah. Uh, last year I got impatient with the batch and I, I was like, well, this, come on. So I turned it up to like medium and to where you could hear it sizzling. And that was, uh, not good. The stuff, um, turned out like, uh, old gas station fried chicken. That's what it tastes like. Yeah. Big Wes, I see you saying plum bob. I know what a plum bob is. Right. Um, yes, yeah, says very nice relic. Oh, I know. It's super cool. Uh, hmm. Matt eight oh eight says any tips on daikon radish? Well, what do you need to know? They grow pretty easily. They grow easily, and uh, they they um, help to sort of till up the earth. They're also called tillage radish, and they like cooler weather. Don't plant them during the middle of summer. Yeah. You know? um, a few more things though about the the uh, tallow, guys. This stuff is incredibly nourishing. All kinds of good minerals in it, brain boosting minerals and vitamins, and uh, it's one of the best fats that you can use. A natural fat in its natural state. Your body knows exactly how to utilize this, guys. It's not like uh, detrimental seed oils and all this. It's got the right ratios of omega threes and sixes and all the good stuff. It is all there. This is one of the oldest, most ancient forms of, of fat cooking oil that humans have consumed. And just like it did 50,000 years ago, it still is amazing for the human body now. So I highly recommend it. Don't, uh, if, if people are thinking beef tallow, they've got all these images of heart attacks and everything. That is the old propaganda. And we have to let that go. Because uh, just like back in the day when the doctors used to say, well, you need to be eating margarine instead of butter. Yeah, because butter is a, is a toxin. Margarine's better. But now it has come out, it's common knowledge now, that margarine is poison. Like poison. Canola oil is like poison. Hydrogenated oils are like poison to the body. Unnatural, bizarre chemical combinations created by the clever mind of man. No, beef tallow is the natural way. And uh, this stuff is amazing. Yeah. So... Kip Tap says, as a tool, it beats the Fisker snips. Oh, it certainly does. You could harvest better with this thing than with those Fiskers. <laughs> so, guys, uh, if you want to get an old book about sprouting, if you can find a copy of this book, this is what started it all for me many years ago. This is a great book. It's got recipes in it and techniques. Um, it's where I learned to sprout from. And then it's got this back part with all these different recipes in it. So this is really utilizing the sprouts. But this is back when this was written in the 70s when it was like all switching over to margarine and stuff. So he talks about adding, you know, a quarter cup of margarine. Now, obviously, we won't be doing that. Um, and we will be using, of course, only natural fats. So but still very cool if you can find one. So that would be a great gift. So here, let, let me show you guys. If you want to get something for someone for Christmas that they would love, okay, you could get them um, a pack of wide mouth mason jars 
with uh, a pack of these lids as well that are in the Amazon storefront, okay? Then also this book, a copy of this book, and some seeds, okay? You could get them some Waltham broccoli seeds, some mammoth red rock cabbage seeds, yes. You could get them some um, uh, organic sango purple radish. Now, I only got a little bit of radish because they're real spicy. They can be real spicy. Uh, and so get them all that stuff, and that would be a wonderful gift. Everything that they need to start sprouting. Yes? Now, I wish that True Leaf had a better affiliate program. I would promote their stuff, but their affiliate program is a joke and totally difficult to understand and just it's just it's a joke. It's not user-friendly at all. And so, you know, I'm not going to, like, push their stuff or anything, but it is where I get mine. So... That being said, it is where I do get mine. Now, a couple of other things, though. You could also do it like this. You could get somebody a stack of these trays, guys. Links are in the Amazon storefront, but uh, these are the bootstrap farmer trays. Way superior to those flimsy little ridiculous things that they sell at like Lowe's and Menards. So get the ones without the holes. Get about 10 of those. Get about five of the ones with the holes, okay, so that we can bottom water our microgreens. Uh, but then you can also get, see, we'll use these for like wheatgrass and stuff because they're a big tray full of stuff. Uh, but for smaller microgreens, we're going to use these. You see these trays here? And so two of these can fit into each one of these. And these have the holes in it. So uh, we can bottom water. So see, we're going to start one thing of microgreens, like one variety, sunflowers maybe, and then the peas on this side. Or maybe we'll do peas on this one and then five days later do peas on that one so that we will have a progression of them. And that's how we're going to do the microgreens. So you could get them those trays and then you could get them some uh, like peas. Yes, the uh, organic speckled peas. And uh, I've got these growing in the basement right now. Pea sprouts are delicious. They taste just like peas just like the peas except even better and uh here's some other microgreen seeds that i got so like the slow bolt arugula it's uh, delicious tastes just like regular arugula and um long island improved brussels sprouts i love brussels sprout microgreens because they taste just like the full brussels sprouts it's awesome so um Let's see here. Gloria Padilla says, no more burpee seeds. I prefer not to purchase them if you no longer recommend them. Thank you very much for being supportive, my friend. And I, I can't say that I don't recommend them for any particular reason. So I'm not going to give them a bad rap um, or anything. Now, I'm going to contact True Leaf again so that I can like understand their affiliate program a bit more just because it's good if i'm recommending it to people uh you know i'm bringing them business so i would kind of like my cut you know what i mean uh but that being said guys true leaf market um for bulk seeds they got good stuff they really do so uh so if you're looking to get seeds you can go to true leaf market and uh, hopefully i'll have links in the description soon um so i can get a little cut of that that would be great but if not at least you guys know the good place to get them and uh, that's where I get them because they come in these nice packages and uh, they just they've got the game down pretty good. So that's where I get bulk seeds. But other seeds I get from Baker Creek, my growing seeds I get from Baker Creek. Yes. But at this point, it's mostly seeds I've saved myself, you know, like mother stallards and pink pink eyes and all kinds of other stuff. <laughs> Jody K says, is one better than the other? Microgreens versus sprouts. Well, they're just different. Not necessarily better. They're just very different. The sprouts are grown for the white sprout. You know, the, the seed head and the white sprout. Microgreens, uh, we actually allow them to grow so that they put down roots and they form the first set uh, uh, um, before they first form their first true leaves. Um, I forget, what's the term for it? Uh, colliden, cotyledon. I forget what's the term for. Uh, how do you pronounce it? Um, the first little set of leaves. That's all that we 
need the microgreens for. And so it takes, it takes about uh, three to five days to sprout seeds in the jar method. Very easy. Doesn't require a uh, heat mat. It doesn't require lighting, nothing like that. It just requires a jar, the lid and the sink. Now the other, um, the other, uh, microgreens requires more stuff. It requires the trays. It requires some lighting, maybe a heat mat, uh, but you're growing it for the the actual green, more like a salad. You can add it to things like your um, like your stews and soups and and dishes and stuff like that. And it's got the chlorophyll in it, and it's got a lot of good nutrients in it. So that's the difference. I, I'm getting the feeling that Scott Miller and Dread are maybe the same person. Uh, do you have two computers going at the same time? My friend, am I catching on to you? <clears throat> um, so, oh, Katalid, Katalidan, Katalidan, it's pronounced. Okay, yes, Katalidan, that's right. Peter Hoffman, thank you. Uh, that is what we are harvesting. We don't actually let them for the microgreens. We don't actually let them grow anymore. There's no need for it. Now, here's the thing that you'll see when the microgreen um, uh, thing comes out, the video comes out the first of the year, is that I grow with worm castings. I mean, either coconut coir, pure coconut coir, with about 15% worm castings. Or um, I could also use just bag soil with some worm castings. But most of the people that um, are talking about microgreens, they're like, oh, you don't need any nutrients whatsoever for microgreens because they contain all of the nutrients that they need. Now, that is partially true. I mean, and you can do hydroponically um, certain types of microgreens. But my experience has been that you get a, a richer plant if you, if you add some worm castings. And the worm castings help to limit the growth of molds on the surface and in the, in the medium of your, uh, of your, um, uh, stuff. So that, that's what I like to do. I like to add some worm castings to it and it produces, especially things like wheat grass and sunflower microgreens that produces a richer, deeper colored and a, a more intense flavor. I've noticed that over the years. So, uh, but not more than 10%, five, 15, 10%. Yes. So Scott, hey, Scott Miller says, first time I've been compared to a computer. I'm just curious because you're the only two that are using caps locks, all caps lock. Yes. <clears throat> uh, so I'm just kind of playing with you anyways. So Girish says, sir, I would like to know whether we can do JLF using metal iron drums. Eventually it's going to rot it out. It's going to eventually rot it out. You can though. Yes. If that's what you have available, it will last for a while. Yeah. 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 You could do that. Um, it, it won't be a big, it just, it will rust on the inside and, and depending on what kind of chemical was in there, but you'll still get a number of seasons out of it. So yeah, you can, it's not going to hurt the plants at all. No, no. Ooh, Big West says OG equals OV. Oh, I like that. Original Viking. Yes, yes. Scott Miller and yourself are OVs. <laughs> I like that. There you go. The fourth Wiseman says 10 to 30% worm casting is best way to get best produce. Above 30%, it's little gain for more input value. Exactly. Yes, that's the key. Uh, 10 to 30% is plenty. I, yeah, I would say 20% even from, for, especially for microgreens is plenty. Uh, seed starting 30%, you know, but microgreens, um, 10, 20% is plenty. And that's going to help be a good balance between, uh, cost and effectiveness. So, um, fortunately I found a place, a local guy that has a worm farm. And so, um, I went and toured his worm farm. He showed me the whole thing, how he's growing them all. It's, it's incredible. It's awesome. And uh, then, so I was like, hey, um, can I get like 10 bags? Can I get a, like a quarter pallet or something? He was like, yeah. So now I got like uh, 10 or 15 bags of worm castings in the basement, which is great because they're local and uh, get to support that business and get to, um, yeah, I said, man, once you get your uh, 
um, internet retail storefront game down, then I will gladly promote these, you know, for no, I mean, no problem, but they're not into that yet. They just want to sell local. Rambet says new here. JLF equals what? JDOM liquid fertilizer. It is a, a term that we use for, um, for any of the liquid ferments where we use the, the leaf mold and water in a barrel or a bucket. Yeah, that's, we're calling those JDOM. I mean, they are. The, the JDOM popularized all of that. Regina RN says, I was just going to ask if you buy your worm casting or have your own worm bins. Now, when I get the land, we will be having our own worm farm. No doubt. When we get the school happening and all of that, uh, then yes. Then, for sure, we'll be growing our own. That's why I was love to see the, um, the operation. It's so simple. Now I know exactly how to replicate that. Um, but no, for now in this place, we're still going to, we're going to support the guys that are doing it. So, yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, let's see. Brian Kubik says, what's your thoughts about green cover seeds? They are more into cover crops and blend multiple blends. Green cover seeds. I'm not sure what that is. Is that a type of uh, of cover crop or is that a company or what? But uh, the thing about the, the multi blends for the cover crops, they can be great depending on your situation. Now, the multi blend cover crops with a bunch of five, nine, 15 different types of plants, those are actually best for soil health because they have a wide diversity of roots. They are the best for the overall soil health and for pollinator. They can be for pollinators and, and, and other things. So uh, that's a very good method, but there's several drawbacks to that. One is that in a no-till system, all of those things are going to have different termination times. So some of them will be cold terminated. Some of them will survive the winter uh, and then grow. And so you'll have all these different termination requirements. Now, if you're going to green manure it, not a problem. Do a multi-blend, till it up, uh, you know, put it in there because then it won't matter. But if you're going to no-till it, you got to know each individual thing and how it's got to be terminated. Because imagine if you had a ryegrass in there, it just is not going to work, you know. Um, so you want to know all of that. Now, another drawback to the multi-plant um, cover crops is that visually, to some people in certain circumstances, uh, it looks like weeds growing. It just looks like a, a weedy field. So if, if you need it to look clean cut for whatever reason, maybe you've got investors or you've got people coming. I'm kind of thinking of you, Jerry. Maybe you've got people you know, looking at the place and it's got to like present itself really nicely then using a single cover crop such as crimson clover or mammoth red clover can look visually very beautiful because it's a nice uniform patch of stuff that's all flowering at the same time. It's the same height. Uh, the pollinators are all over it and it terminates all at the same time. So it can be easier to work with uh, that. So there's pros and cons to everything. You just got to know what your goal is for using it. All right. Yes. Kathy Tittle, I need a worm farm for my chickens. You need to get the soldier fly larva bin. Look that up, guys. Uh, the soldier fly larva bin. Definitely. I will be doing that the moment we can get chickens. Man, they just did another vote. They just did, I just saw in the paper. They just did another vote here in Fort Wayne. Uh, and they shot down. They shot down the chickens ordinance. Says, nope. Nope, you can't have chickens in the city. Mm -mm. Nope. That was the second time that it's been brought back up in like five years. And uh, I said, nope, mm, can't have chickens if you're in the city. For what? For what? Because they're loud? Okay, well, these junkyard dogs right across the way are awfully loud, barking every second that they're outside, just barking at the wind, mindlessly for nothing. You know, all these dogs around here, constantly hear dogs barking. 
Uh, now, if you don't have a rooster, the chickens are not really loud. They're not really dirty um, because they're eating the insects. And so I don't buy it. Eastside Emu says, uh, garlic and onions is not bulbing good. Even when I plant it in winter, what am I doing wrong? Okay. Where are you at and what varieties are you using? And is it getting cold enough? Is it, um, do you have enough, um, do you have enough nutrients? Okay. Contrary to popular belief, they need nitrogen, a good amount of nitrogen as well. So all those things can come into play there. Julie Pooley says, uh, we are finally allowed chickens, but so many restrictions, you really can't have them unless you have lots of land. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, here it would have to be an unfortunate situation. You'd have to get one of them coops where they never come out of, you know what I mean? I mean, it, it could be 10 by 15 or whatever. Um, but it couldn't be like, you couldn't just let them out in the garden. They would destroy things. They would destroy the garden. Uh, I mean, I know this from when we lived off grid. Rambet, would you add sulfur to your garlic bed? Absolutely, yes, yes. You can add it, uh, it's good to add it in the form of the J-Dom sulfur. So you can mix up a batch of the J-Dom sulfur if you've made that. If you watch that on the channel, it's a natural pesticide that we use sulfur, uh, except we, chem we chemically melt it. And so it's uh, very easy to work with and spray and all of that. And uh, yes. Sulfur will help any of the allium family, definitely. VA Green says, move to the Appalachians, Nate, live free. Oh, man, you're telling me. I know. I know. I used to live in Humboldt County, way out in the mountains, way out. It was wild. I mean, wild there in a redwood grove on a 220-acre ranch. That had been, It's just crazy. Yeah, how free everything was. And it's just, then you come back to, it took me several years to adjust back to, I mean, I'm still, you're still never, once the wildness of the land gets in you, it never leaves you. It's just, it's, you're totally changed. It's calling to me all the time. Oh, the land is saying, come on, you know, you need to come back, nurture the land, get the animals happening, get the school happening. You know, it, the land is like, we want that energy, you know? So it's happening. It's just, uh, in the, in the meantime, it's like, man, all these restrictions can't have chickens. Can't, can't have anything. It's just, you have to live your little city life. So, but you got to adjust and adapt. You got to find the way uh, to still do what you got to do, even within the restrictions. So, and not a problem. <laughs> Freebird says driving and listening, but had to pull over to comment. Chickens are very quiet and rooster only talks a few times a day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, one, for pulling over before you text that. Uh, we can all thank you for that. But also, yes, I totally agree. And that's why the people that say, nope, no chickens. And they've never had chickens before, obviously. Because um, they're not really that loud. Kathy Tittle says, oh yeah, I buy the bags of soldier worms, dead, expensive, yeah, but you can get the soldier fly larva maker, essentially, with, you know, the thing with the tote and the little PVC things, you can put the compost scraps up in the thing, and then they just fall on the ground, and your chickens will love them. Uh, who made a video recently, not that long ago, about it, um, Nature's Always Right? Yeah, he's got some good stuff on his channel, so... You can check out that video. If you want to see how to make it, he's got, I think, two different videos. One, he made one a particular way. And then a couple years later, he came back with an improved way to make it. So um, you can go to Nature's Always Right and you can check out Soldier Fly or, or Chicken Feed or something like that. And that will be the video that I'm talking about. Yeah, Other people have produced him as well, but he's got a good channel. So... Wild Bill says, just tuned in, but I'll listen to it later. All right, my friend. It's always good to go back and catch what you missed. So, 
Okay, Girish says, Sir, I regularly watch your videos. Thanks for teaching J Dom. I am currently doing grass JLF. I was curious to know what will be the NPK value of three months old grass JLF. Now that's the thing guys with J Dom system, the natural farming system, the K and F, and just uh, what we're, we could call the Viking system as well. You know, we don't really pay attention to NPK because the whole mindset of NPK as the primary driver behind fertilizers uh, is has to do with the green revolution, the modern industrial agriculture, chemical farming. That's when N, P, and K matters. Um, but when we're doing the natural farming methods, which rely on the soil food web, then it doesn't matter nearly as much. So we don't test, and there's so much variation between the, the quality of the inputs versus uh, what they're what the uh, versus what the thing is going to produce. And so um, that's why the NPK, we don't really pay attention to it in the natural farming methods. We just give them a balanced thing. We just give them a balance of nutrients that they can have when they need it. That's what nature does. Nature never divides the fertilizers. And nature doesn't say, okay, in the springtime, we're going to give it uh, a 35-10-10. And then in the in the uh, when it begins bulb production, then we're gonna pump in some uh, zero fifty two ten, you know, because we want to keep them them bulbs nice and tight, and we want to limit that vegetative growth. No, nature never does that. Nature says, here it is, when you need it, it will be there. So we give you a balanced source of nourishment, and uh, the microorganisms will be able to give it to you when you call for it, meaning the plant. And this is pretty much how it does. Now, in general, the grass JLF, the um, fish JLF, the chicken manure JLF, those are all going to be higher in nitrogen, generally. They will generally produce more luscious leafy growth than, say, the, um, the ash fertilizer, yeah, or um, some of the other JLFs. I can't think of them all right now. But for the most part, it's all balanced, okay? Yes. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, B. Johnson says, yay, my Baker Creek order just arrived. Thank you for the recommendation, Nate. I cannot wait for the 2024 season. Yes, guys. Um, so join the Discord and let us know what you're going to be planting, okay? We're going to have some kind of a giveaway. Once I figure out how to do it, uh, we're going to have some kind of a giveaway. So you'll have to join the Discord and then post pictures to the to the section that says pictures, you know, of your garden. And we'll have like a best uh, seed starting setup category, a best um, garden category, and then like a best harvest category. And we'll uh, see what kind of pictures we can get from you guys because that's what I want. Also, do it on Instagram. If you guys are on Instagram, definitely post a picture to your account, tag me in it, at Garden Like a Viking, uh, or put uh, use the hashtag Garden Like a Viking. Do all of that because um, once the season is like on the horizon again, then I'm going to be way into all that again. Instagram constantly and uh, uh, Facebook or the uh, videos constantly, shorts all the time and stuff. Yeah, definitely. We got more of a plan of attack this year uh, as far as the videos and all of that, a, met um, a methodology. So we're just laying low for now. Look what just came in the mail. Yes. They gave me two of them because they were like, well, Obviously, you need to be giving this knowledge out to people. So, uh, but yeah, it's a very, very thin one this year, definitely. But these are great, guys. McKinsey, yes, says spreading the cow manure today. How exciting. Taking a break and tuning in. Oh, man, I love doing that too. That's such a nice time when you know that you're feeding the soil. Everything is going to be growing. Zygmunt says, recommended flower collection for garden, ones that have function. Oh, absolutely. First and foremost is going to be calendula. You can use it as a tea, as a salve. Uh, also, it's pest repellent. Also, it's a trap plant for aphids, definitely. Um, likewise, nasturtiums. 
Those uh, vine across the ground and do really well as a ground cover, and their pungent smell helps to repel insects. Uh, also marigolds. I got marigolds everywhere. The pungent smell helps to repel the insects. Uh, also the coxcomb, the celosia. We have those all over the place. Pollinators love those things. And um, it seems to really attract praying mantises. There are so many praying mantises this past year. It's crazy. Um, and then also herbs like um, chamomile. We grow chamomile all over the place and summer savory and basil and oregano and thyme and rosemary. All that stuff helps to um, attract pollinators and also to repel insects. Okay. A um, couple more things, guys. If you're thinking of something for someone for Christmas, a last uh, idea. You guys have heard me talk about these before, but uh, these are handmade by this little old lady that uh, is in Oregon somewhere. And I met her when I was traveling, but she has a little business, but you got to contact her. These are the greatest sandals I've ever come across, ever. I, I bought multiple. I, I walked through, I walked thousands of miles in my first pair. Uh, I, it's all I wore through India and Thailand. Oh man, it was crazy. And they are the most comfortable, supportive shoes I've ever experienced. They feel like, um, like you just have clouds on your feet and, and they mold to your footbed. So she doesn't even know that I recommend her stuff, but I've done this a couple of times. So it's, uh, you'll have to check out, you have to go to her website. It's, I think, cool mocks or cool shoes.com. Her name is Penny and you have, she's old school though. You have to like actually tell her what you want and then tell her your size and all that. And then, um, you have to mail her a money order like that. And when she gets the money order, then she will send out your stuff, but she's legit super cool handmade they last a very long time uh, can't recommend them highly enough and they look super cool so any of you guys um, they, they, they look like spartan design um, likewise any guys in your family um, or ladies the uh, 511 i mean i've i am huge on footwear because it's just so important to the experience uh, um, and so 511 and this are the uh ATC eight inch arid. I bought, I literally bought like four pairs of these uh, last year because they're the greatest boot I've ever experienced. I never want to be without them. Feather light guys. And they zip on and off and they breathe. They're made for the high, hot desert. Okay. They're made for the hot desert. And uh, these are fantastic. I did a half marathon. Me and Jenny, when we did that half marathon, I was wearing these. I was wearing these. Everybody was laughing. Well, not laughing, but commenting maybe they were laughing i don't know but um guys they're as lightweight as a running shoe but they're super supportive so i highly recommend them to you guys and once you tie them the right size you zip them on and off like that boom and uh well yeah you zip them on and off and they're super easy they just stay on and can't recommend them highly enough so that's the thing. If you guys, uh, yeah, great ankle support, all kinds of other stuff. Uh, yeah, 511, 5.11. That is the, uh, if you guys want to get some of these, it's 511. I think they might be in my Amazon storefront. Um, but yeah, I'm not affiliated with any of these people or any of this stuff. I'm just giving you this person to person, friend to friend. Um, and if there's a link in the description, then that's great. It's just Amazon stuff. Uh, so use that. But also get the mushrooms, guys. We got the um, we got them inoculating. We got them colonizing right now. All you got to do is use the link in the description and get the uh, yellow oysters or the blue oysters. And then watch my video about um, sterilizing the straw. Very easy. You just bring the straw up to 170 degrees for one hour in the boiling in the water, uh, and then you take it out and you inoculate them. You mix in some of the uh, grain with it. And now it's going to take a few weeks, but then we're going to peel these off and put them into the fruiting chamber, which is just a high humid, uh, humid and cool place. And they will be, each one of these is going to be a huge flush of the mushrooms. So it's actually way easier than it might seem. So I highly recommend you guys getting in on it. Okay. We got plenty of time left this year. Big Wes, yeah, these uh, these are very reasonable. They're only like 
well, this is reasonable to me, 120. They're like 120. You can get them on sale sometimes for like 100. Um, uh, a couple, one time they were on sale for $80. That's when I bought four pairs. You know, so uh, because good footwear is just incredible. Now, they're not like the big, they're not like the big um, Irish setters and the, the certain type, the Danners and stuff that are going to last you a lifetime. These will not last a lifetime. They're good for like three years. You know, that, that, that's about their useful function is about three years, but they're not meant to last a lifetime because they're so light and easy. You, you feel like a ninja when you're wearing them. So at least I do. Okay, guys. So, yes. Now there was one more question. B. Johnson says, let me try this question one more time. Haha, <laughs> Nate. The last two years, my winter squash would only produce male flowers and no female flowers. So no squash. Any suggestions? Now, that can be multifaceted. The plant can be stressed out. I would have to see what are the growing conditions. What is the sunlight like? You need to have... Uh, ample root space and they have to have full sun they want to be nice and healthy and they can't be over fertilized too much nitrogen can stress them out and produce so what were you fertilizing with okay so there's not just like a one fix all answer it's a multifaceted you have to say so maybe go to the discord post some pictures if you have of when they were growing what their root um, container or what their root situation is like, what their sunlight situation is like, what kind of food have you given them? Do they get plenty of, um, of, uh, airflow to the root zone? Do they get hot root zone? What, I mean, all these things can come into play, you know, tag me in it, say at garden, like a Viking or do it on Instagram, you know, post the stuff. And then, um, um, so that I can see it because the plant is just stressed out and some, something is stressing the plant out. Uh, because they don't want to do that. They don't want to produce only male flowers. That's not conducive to their survival. They want to produce, um, you know, about a three to one. You know, three males for every female is about what they want. So, um, okay, guys. Man, look at that. 96 minutes already. 97 minutes. The time has flown by. Yes. Okay, guys. So, uh, Colchester Council Watch. Did you change your name? Is that Rachel? Did you change your name to that? Uh, or am I mistaken? So, okay, guys. Well, we uh, got to get going because I'm going to go see my mom. We're about to go to Costco. About to get us uh, a stand-up freezer or get me i'm about to get a stand-up freezer because the chest freezers uh just they're just not working that well when you buy a like a side of beef you know like i'm getting another one from jerry this coming uh, in a month uh the um you, you can't see what's in them i i mean I, the stand-up freezer with the drawers is going to be way better for seeing what you have because i know for sure uh, i mean that I just got a bunch of types of meat and stuff in there that I don't even remember. And if you want to get something to buy, you got to pull out all the stuff. The chest freezer is not making sense for me. So um, that's what I'm doing. Uh, let's see here. Rachel says, yes, my other channel. Well done. See, I know. I know. Okay, guys. Uh, Big West says, I'm the last loser to go on Discord. Really? I figured you'd be blowing that up a long time ago. So, okay, guys, we will see you here next Saturday, 12 noon. We will see you uh, to the Thrive Like a Viking, guys. We are going to be doing our standard uh, 10, 30 a.m. Eastern time uh, on the Thrive Like a Viking channel, and we will see you guys there. Hopefully, you've got your uh, The Power of Now book. Uh, we're going to talk, introduce about that, but and we're going to figure out how we're going to do the group read for The Power of Now, okay? Um, let's see... Yeah, Richard, uh, Sarah says, noted visibility of the, fr the freezer. I'm buying one next year. Yeah, I know, uh, because the chest freezer just isn't making sense. you got to dig so deep into it and pull stuff out and all that, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, my friends, it's been real. We will see you next time. Ooh, a lawn section. Okay, look to nature. I will do that. 
I know that uh, Big Wes is going to be happy about that. We'll put a lawn section in the Discord. <laughs>